Welcome everyone to the Thurgood Marshall Memorial Lecture, which this year is also serving as uh, part of the President's Distinguished Lecture series and the Talking About Race, Gender, and Power series. Uh, I want to thank President Farish uh, for his support. He couldn't be uh, with us this evening, but he sends uh, his regards. I want to give special thanks to the uh, law firm of Hinckley, Allen, and Snyder for their support for the Marshall Lecture. Uh, they have been with us uh, since the beginning uh, in 2001 when uh, Eric Holder gave the inaugural lecture years before he became uh, the, um, the Attorney General of the United States. Uh, and I'm also delighted to welcome back uh, to his alma mater and, and thank Adam Ramos, uh, who is now a partner at Hinckley and has been instrumental in continuing uh, the support of this uh, lecture series. I also think it's appropriate um, just for us as a group to take a moment and think about uh, giving thanks to Justice Marshall's widow, Cecilia Marshall, um, who endorsed this lecture series years ago and um, for many years joined us um, outside, you can see a picture uh, of her with our 2006 speaker, uh, Devin Carbato. Um, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education, uh, our Marshall speaker, uh, David Wilkins, who clerked for the justice, said that he had absolutely no doubt that the justice could not have done the work that he did uh, without the support uh, of, of Mrs. Marshall. Uh, and Mrs. Marshall, on, on that occasion, in this very room, uh, said that the lesson she took um, 50 years after Brown versus Board was that we need less blind optimism and more appreciation for how much hard work remains to be done and with the support of Hinkley, Hinkley Allen and with the participation of many of you, uh, we've been able to talk about that hard work here uh, for almost two uh, decades. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Richard Thompson Ford, who is the George Osborne Professor of Law at Stanford Law School. I first became aware uh, of his work in 2008 when he published The Race Card, uh, in which he argues, and I will not do this justice, I didn't, um, he's right here. Um, he'll correct me if I'm wrong, that spurious claims of race discrimination distract attention uh, from the important and unaddressed problems of racial inequality that continue to plague uh, our society. Uh, it was a very challenging argument, separating the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, and one reviewer from the New York Times described it as relentlessly even-handed which is a very nice compliment. Uh, he followed that up with uh, a book called Rights Gone Wrong, in which he argues that both the left and the right uh, are mistaken in the way that they conceive of problematic race discrimination. Um, this even-handedness or bipartisanship is a compelling characteristic of his work, which appears not only in his books, but in law journals and in the popular press. He's been on the Colbert Report, for those of you who are interested. His writing appears in major newspapers and in what we used to call magazines. Um, indeed, in describing a recent article that he wrote for one of those uh, magazines, The American Interest, uh, about what he termed, has termed, the Trump post-white presidency, uh, Professor Ford himself wrote that it was, quote, guaranteed to anger almost everyone left and right. Uh, he is currently uh, at work on a book about dress codes. Uh, some of us had the opportunity to hear him talk about that uh, earlier today. It's a fascinating uh, project, and I commend to you uh, his recent articles about President Trump's ties and why they really matter. Uh, and he will be signing copies of uh, Universal Rights Down to Earth. Um, they are available uh, just outside the room. That's his book about the global human rights movement. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Richard Thompson Ford.
thanks everyone for um, coming to see me and thank you for inviting me here for this prestigious lecture. I'm, I'm honored and, and pleased to be here. Um, I uh, fear that I may not live up to the, uh, the introduction as quite as heterodox a thinker as um, I was uh, made out to be, but I have done um, in the past a lot of work to try to make the case that um, some of the ways that we habitually think about um, racial and other social injustices in our society are um, at best incomplete and in some circumstances counterproductive. Uh, now, one of the, um, when I wrote the race card many years ago in 2005, um, I argued that there was a widespread consensus norm that explicit um, expressions of racism were unacceptable in our society. Um, times change. <laughs> and um, part of what I'd like to do today is kind of update some of the arguments I made in that book, um, arguing that while just about everything I said was still right, there are, um, in, in the contemporary environment, reasons um, still to be concerned about unjustified claims of racism and also reasons to be concerned about um, a too narrow and too formalistic view of what counts as, um, as, as social injustice or discriminatory bias. Um, so in that book and in Rights Gone Wrong, I, I, I make these claims. Um, I'll start by talking a little bit about something that happened back in 2005, Hurricane Katrina. Um, because that's uh, an instant, instance which I think brought to the fore uh, a lot of the problems that I want to address today. Um, as on the one hand, there was a norm that explicit expressions of racial bias were unacceptable. And um, as a result, one, most people who were biased hid their biases. Um, and two, I think it was fair to say that the amount of um, conscious bias in the society had declined quite significantly since the 1960s. And yet, at the same time, racial injustices were and are everywhere. Um, and I can give you the familiar litany, um, policing and criminal justice. Um, in fact, racial profiling, which was the hot topic in 2005, now seems almost quaint in the wake of Black Lives Matter and the um, injustices that that movement has brought to our attention. Employment discrimination continues to be an enormous problem, segregation in public schools and in neighborhoods. And Hurricane Katrina brought a lot of this to the fore because, of course, after the hurricane hit and the levees failed, what was quite clear uh, was that the African American community suffered the uh, disproportionate brunt of the aftermath. Um, not only that, but the response of the federal government, which was um, by most accounts inadequate, by some accounts inept, um, to many seemed to be so in part because of the people who were suffering. Um, so at that time, one you may remember, um, during a fundraiser for the victims of Hurricane Katrina, uh, the musician Kanye West said, George Bush doesn't like black people, kind of a, a spontaneous outburst. Um, and I argued at the time, and I would still argue today, that that response was both understandable and unfair. Understandable because Katrina and the inadequate response to it did disproportionately harm black people, and that racial inequity was not an accident. Um, everyone understood that. Um, Unfair because there was no evidence that George Bush was a racist. Um, instead, the inequities were the result of the continuing effects of past racism, in particular neighborhood segregation, the isolation of poor African American communities um, in neighborhoods that were both more, more vulnerable to this type of disaster and um, lack the resources to avoid or get out of those circumstances. It may be fair to say that the federal response was colored by politics, um, the people in New Orleans not being among the, uh, the, the, the supporters, by and large, of the Republican Party. Uh, and all of those fe features led to an understandable claim of racial injustice, but was George Bush a racist? If George Bush doesn't like black people, what are we to say about a man who 
spearheaded the birther slander against President Obama, um, insisted that black defend criminal defendants were guilty after they had been exonerated by DNA evidence, um, described a conflict between white supremacists and their opponents as one in which there were fine people on both sides, um, and called um, African and majority black and majority Latino nations shitholes when discussing their immigration priorities. What I'd want to suggest is that it may be that in calling Bush a racist without much evidence, it's made it a bit easier, and I would argue all too easy, to, for some people to deny that Trump is one, in spite of a lot of evidence. Um, after all, in today's environment, there's a common discourse that um, liberals just play the race card against anyone with whom they disagree. So the problems I want to address today are that we live in a society in which there are lots of racial injustices, neighborhood segregation, the incarceration rate, unemployment, police violence. Um, but many of these problems, not all, but many, don't fit the conventional civil rights model well. We can't find a racist. Um, we can't find explicit discrimination. Um, civil rights were, in, in the conventional sense, were astoundingly successful in dealing with blatant Jim Crow-style discrimination. And I want to emphasize they're still doing lots of important work today. As my comments just suggested, overt racism is far from gone in our society, and examples of um, explicit discriminatory policies are still, there, there are still plenty of them. But um, the conventional civil rights approach does too much and not enough at the same time. So, I'll talk about a few examples of that. Uh, 50 years after Brown versus Board of Education, um, we still have schools where roughly one quarter of black students in the Northeast and Midwest attend schools that are almost entirely non-white. And at the same time, civil rights laws, in fact, the same principle articulated in Brown versus Board of Education, now prohibits modern, modest efforts to integrate the schools. Um, you might say, well, that's just a problem of conservative justices who perverted the civil rights movement, and it's true to some extent, but not entirely. Um, laws, for instance, against sex discrimination um, haven't done much to change the wage inequities that leave women earning 70 to 80 cents on the dollar as compared to men. Um, but those laws against sex discrimination do, in many states in the United States, um, allow men to sue and recover thousands of dollars for discrimination when in uh, nightclubs have ladies' night. Um, and that at least might suggest a misplaced set of priorities that I'll argue is a, re is a um, consequence of a particular legalistic way of looking at the problem of inequality in our society. Um, and finally, police violence is endemic in our society, um, and yet a consistent frustration since Black Lives Matter has been the fact that there are very few indictments of police officers responsible for that violent and even fewer convictions. And I'll argue part of that is because we're looking for a specific individual to blame for the problem of police violence when we ought to be um, and need to be looking for institutional um, and cultural factors that produce an environment in which that kind of violence is almost inevitable. Uh, okay, I'd like to start by talking about Brown versus Board of Education. Um, obviously, one of the most, if not the most important case in the civil rights canon, um, and a case that did a great deal to advance the norm that um, explicit racial classifications and explicit statements of racial bias are unacceptable in our society. Um, on Brown's 50th, the, the 50th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education, there was a lot of celebration and a lot of patting um, ourselves on the back about how far we come as a nation with respect to racial uh, equality. But um, at that same time, the Harvard Civil Rights Project, for instance, pointed out that a substantial group of American schools are virtually all non-white, and those schools um, educate uh, roughly a quarter of all black and Latino kids nationwide. Um, in 2006, two of every five black and Latino public school students attended a school that was over 90% non 
white. Um, and the segregation of to our public schools is actually getting worse, not better. Um, and it has been over the past um, decade or so, at least. Um, the situation even um, in 2006 was dire enough that um, the law professor and veteran civil rights lawyer Derek Bell um, went so far as to suggest that the nation's um, minority children might have been better off if Brown had come out the other way, um, and the nation had instead committed itself to the breached promise of separate but equal, in other words, focused on the equal. This was someone who dedicated his life to fighting racial injustices. Um, he wrote, Brown is a magnificent mirage to which all aspire without any serious, serious thought that it will ever be attained. Um, and then finally, and in my view perhaps worst of all, in 2007, the Supreme Court held that the legal precedent of Brown versus Board of Education um, uh, prohibited policies that advanced integration. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So we have, in one sense, in a practical sense, um, the argument in Brown being flipped on its head by 2007. Um, after Brown versus Board of Education, a few things happened. Um, and one thing to, to notice is that in the context of Brown, a lot of disparate factors came together. You had an explicit racial classification, to be sure. Um, you also had explicit and undenied racial animus, stereotyping, psychological injury um, to students of color, uh, in, inadequate and unequal resources. All of these things came together in Brown. And the court at Brown didn't feel the need to disaggregate those factors, and neither did the lawyers arguing the case, and for very understandable reasons. And so we got um, statements to the effect that the problem was that the state had classified its citizens according to race. Um, now, after Brown, as is well known, many of the southern school districts um, resisted in what's been come to be known as massive resistance. And at the end of the era of massive resistance, after um, federal funding was tied to making serious efforts to reverse the policies of Jim Crow, we got instead a lot of policies designed to reproduce the effects of Jim Crow without making an explicit racial classification. That much is quite clear. And the result of all that was that the courts had to dig deeper. They had to push um, into the effects as well as the, um, the, the, the express motivations of racial injustices. And the result was um, a, what we now what we now remember as a series of more assertive efforts to desegregate the public schools, to move closer to something like statistical, statistical deconcentration. Those efforts in the 1970s um, often took the form of busing, against which there was a great deal of resistance in many white communities, um, including uh, violent resistance in some context, such that um, in, for instance, South Boston, whites boycotted the public schools in response to desegregation efforts, and white mobs threw stones at school buses carrying the children um, t from the predominantly black Roxbury neighborhood to, um, to the schools in South Boston. And similar in instances occurred in other contexts, with the result that, understandably, some parents of African-American children asked whether or not there may be another way forward, a way that didn't involve sending their kids into a war zone. Um, and yet, these compromise approaches were, in some sense, a betrayal of the ideal of the civil rights movement. And so civil rights lawyers naturally, and again, understandably, resisted the idea that, they, that there ought to be um, such compromises. Um, there were also practical impediments. For instance, um, as the desegregation cases worked their way through the federal courts, the composition of many of the school districts that had been responsible for Jim Crow segregation had changed. So, um, in 1952, for instance, the Atlanta School District was 32 percent black. Um, by 1974, uh, it was 82 percent black. The Detroit School District um, was over 90 percent black by the time the remedies began to make their way to the federal courts. And all of that made it 
not just difficult, but in some cases impossible to achieve meaningful integration um, within the conventional civil rights model proposed in which we look for a villain, in which we look for a responsible entity and charge it with uh, achieving the remedy. Um, a case called Millikan versus Bradley makes that quite clear because in 1971 in Millikan, after Detroit's public schools had become um, overwhelmingly African American, a district court found that relief of segregation in the public schools cannot be accomplished within the, ge the corporate geographic limits of the city. Um, in other words, the school district within the city is too, now too heavily black um, for us to achieve meaningful segregation. So the court devised a desegregation plan that included the suburbs of Detroit. And affirming, the Sixth Circuit um, noted that if we were to hold that a school district boundaries were an absolute barrier to the Detroit school desegregation plan, we would be opening a way to nullify Brown versus Board of Education. Um, the Supreme Court, however, in Millikan versus Bradley did exactly that and held that the um, record contained evidence of segregated conditions in, only in Detroit schools and therefore only Detroit could be required to remedy the segregation, not its surrounding suburbs, um, even though it was conceded that Detroit alone could not do so. Um, so local government territorial boundaries are now doing the work of segregation in Millikan and in a lot of other districts in the United States. In some sense, the people who are responsible for de jure segregation have decamped to the suburbs. But the suburban districts as districts never engaged in de jure discrimination. And so the Supreme Court says they can't be required to participate in the remedy. Uh, so I want, what I want us to notice here is that we have a, a structural feature um, but a legal feature, boundaries between Detroit and Gross Point are law. Uh, they're not features of nature or topography, they're laws. But those laws aren't interrogated. Um, and the result is, as the Sixth Circuit said, that we've opened a way to nullify Brown versus Board of Education. Um, subsequently, in the 1990s, we had courts, um, in one sense, kind of adopting uh, a peace with honor approach to the struggle for um, school desegregation and declaring district after district in compliance, um, having achieved what's called unitary status. Now, this is despite the fact that the schools remain segregated. And as a result of all that, and as a result of um, relaxing or abandoning the effort to desegregate the schools, we're now moving in the opposite direction. Um, then we get in 2007 to uh, the parents involved case. Now at this point, um, the school districts are, that are engaged in desegregation plans, most of them, are doing so voluntarily. They've been declared in unitary status. They're no longer under court order. Um, but they're doing something uh, at, in continuing some of the policies in a milder form, but continuing some of the policies that the courts had imposed. Um, Seattle, Washington, and Louisville, Kentucky are among those uh, school districts and have mild desegregation plans involving magnet schools and involving um, the use of race as one factor among many in breaking ties to determine who can enter a school. So the idea is that if your presence will help to integrate the school, that's one factor among a lot of others for school assignment. Um, and the Supreme Court strikes it down um, quoting Brown versus Board of Education. Um, so no state has any authority to use race as a factor in affording educational opportunities to, among its citizens. Um, in the oral argument in Brown versus Board of Education, um, the Supreme Court takes that up and concludes that the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. Sounds good, neat, syllogistic formulation. Um, and as a result, one way of looking at the doctrine is that we have a consistent application of the law across the cases. Another way of looking at those, that development is that Brown has been turned on its head. Um, so that 
a legal doctrine that everyone at the time of Brown understood was designed in order to prevent the segregation of the schools um, is now designed, applied to prevent the integration of the schools. Um, but from a sufficiently scholastic legal perspective, it makes sense. Um, is it really so hard to tell the difference between such defensible and pernicious uses of race? I'd argue at the time of Brown versus Board of Education, it was quite clear uh, that when the attorneys involved argued against allowing the state to classify its, their students because of race, they understood that in a social context in which those classifications um, not only came with stigmatizing meaning, but also came with profound um, material consequences that were quite the opposite in um, 2007 with respect to the plans at issue in Louisville and uh, Seattle. Now, one might say, well, very well and good, but this is just conservatives cynically hijacking the civil rights movement and its um, doctrine for their own purposes. That's, that's all we're talking about here. Oh. And I'd say not only that, it may be partially that, but not only that, um, liberals too have adopted some surprising applications of um, civil rights laws. For instance, um, in 2008, um, a California plaintiff filed a lawsuit to stop Mother's Day, a sex discrimination lawsuit. Um, what happened in 2005, the California Angels baseball team held a Mother's Day celebration and they handed out goodie bags to all of the mothers who were attending the game. But since they couldn't be sure who were mothers and who weren't, the team decided to generalize mothers as females 18 years and over and give them and only them a Mother's Day gift bag. Uh, the plaintiff in the case was a man, didn't fit the description, and didn't get a gift bag, and sued um, for sex discrimination. Um, now, it turns out he lost that lawsuit, but this lawsuit wasn't as crazy as it sounded because um, plaintiffs in California had prevailed in suing for sex discrimination in the context of ladies' night promotions at bars and nightclubs. And they'd prevailed in many, many different cases, not just in New York, but in states all over the United States, not all states, but many, based on the observation that ladies' night is sex discrimination. Straightforward. Any kind of promotion that's applied to women and not to men counts as sex discrimination. We had similar lawsuits, some successful, against um, gyms that set up separate um, workout facilities for men and women um, for reasons that may be controversial but are at least understandable and I think not understandable in terms of hostility towards either men or women. Um, Rita Haley, the president for the New York City chapter of the National Organization for Women, remarked, I'm concerned that we're looking for discrimination in all the wrong places. Um, and yet it wasn't just opportunistic lawyers or, um, or conservatives seeking to hijack civil rights policy, but also California's um, famously liberal Supreme Court Justice Rose Byrd, who said the legality of sex-based discounts cannot depend on subjective value judgments about the types of sex-based distinctions that are important or harmful. Um, and uh, so I'd suggest that that, um, it, 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 she wanted, went on to say that um, one act of discrimination can't cancel out another, so that if a bar has a um, ladies' night and then a men's night, as some did in order to try to balance things out, um, said that if a bar had a white's night followed by a black's night, no one would blink an eye at denouncing each night as discriminatory. Um, so discrimination is discrimination. I'd suggest that this echoes the argument made by the Supreme Court and parents involved, that we can't tell the difference between policies that are benign and malignant, that we can't tell the difference between policies that further and entrench historical patterns of disadvantage and those that do not do so and perhaps even reverse those patterns. Um, and I would suggest that not only can we, but we must make such value judgments. 
um, that the narrow and scholastic view of our employment discrimination laws is not only inadequate to capturing much of the injustice that goes on in our society, but it's actually counterproductive, um, as we can see, particularly in the case of parents involved, which flips Brown versus Board of Education for practical purposes on its head. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the kinds of social injustices we face now um, and how some of those, uh, many of those, won't be addressed by um, looking for discrete discriminatory actions or actors. Um, so in my stomping ground, the Silicon Valley, um, in which most people running companies um, express pretty liberal views on social issues. Um, women, for instance, are you know, kind of like when you type into the web browser, but the address is gone, you get the 404 error not found. Well, that's women in high tech. Um, 17 percent uh, at, at Google, um, 3 of 36 percent, and worse in some contexts. Very small numbers. Um, and it's very difficult to argue that those kinds of disparities are, are a result either of lack of qualifications or lack of interest on the part of women for what are some of the most well-paid um, and um, powerful jobs in the new economy. Um, instead, what you seem to have in the context of high tech is a culture um, of a boys club. Uh, many of these companies, in fact, started off in fraternities um, or dorms among a group of young men, and as they grew, they weren't thinking about how to be the most inclusive workplace. They were simply thinking about how to get the next round of venture capital funding um, and developed a culture, which was a lot like the culture of a fraternity. And surprise, surprise, that culture is not a great fit for women. Um, and now one of the main uh, the, the rationales expressed by companies in the Silicon Valley when they reject applicants is a lack of culture fit. Very common justification. Um, I, in some instances, you'll find explicit sexist and explicit sexist comments, but they don't always line up with the biggest problems in terms of the disparities. They can be hard to prove, uh, or hard to prove the relationship between the sexist comment and the decision making, so causation is a problem. Um, but we know we have a problem, I would argue. Um, Again, this doesn't mean that we should abandon the civil rights approach when it's working, but it need, means we need more and we shouldn't allow it to capture our imagination um, as the universe and the full extent of possible approaches to dealing with social injustice. Um, I could talk a little bit about race in the context of, uh, there are a few more statistics of, that, that demonstrate both with respect to race and with respect to sex, the um, disparity in um, the workforce in Silicon Valley. That was just a few years ago. Um, but let's talk about policing for just a moment. Um, Black Lives Matter has drawn our attention to the problem of um, police abuses and racial injustices and criminal justice, but obviously this problem is nothing new. This is just the latest iteration in decades of um, conflicts between the black community and police, every one of which generated an outcry and a promise to fix the problem um, and was described as a wake-up call and every one of which uh, failed to do so so that we're still fighting the same fight um, 50, 60 years later. Um, even now, the, it's difficult to find the uh, responsible officer against whom prosecutors are willing to indict or grand juries are willing to indict and even harder to get convictions. Um, and yet we have instance after instance of the problem continuing unabated. Um, these are just a few examples of people ma basically making the same observation about each incident time after time. Um, are we looking, though, for uh, discriminatory actors or is there something more complicated going on? In Baltimore, for instance, one of the more egregious incidents, you three of the f six officers accused in the Freddie Gray killing were black. The police chief was black, mayor was black. Um, it, that's not exactly the 
description of a Jim Crow type system of discrimination. And yet, the problem is undeniable. Um, a few reasons why that are structural. In Ferguson, we'll remember the, um, uh, the Justice Department found that the police department was engaged in revenue policing. They're pulling people over for minor infractions, not because they think the infraction is a problem, but because they need to raise money for their cash-strapped police department. That's a structural problem. It has to do with local government boundaries again, just like the problem in Millicent. It has to do with the decentralization of the responsibility for law enforcement in our society, which is something that's quite unique to the United States. I find in talking to people in other countries, they're quite shocked to learn just how decentralized the responsibility for something as important as law enforcement um, and the state's monopoly on violence is in the United States. So that we have a situation in which some police departments are so cash strapped that they need to engage in this kind of policing um, that creates the overwhelming likelihood that we'll have a spiral um, of, of um, escalation and the problems get out of control. Um, in terms of actual death, uh, according to the Berkeley Law professor uh, Frank Zimring, who just wrote a, an excellent book called When Police Kill, um, roughly, police kill roughly 1,000 uh, Americans every year in the United States. Um, African Americans are 2.3 times more likely to be killed by police than whites. Um, part of the problem is neighborhood segregation, once again and the concentration of African-American in neighborhoods that are understood to be or defined to be problems for the police, places where police are intervene in a distinctive and more aggressive manner. Um, to be sure, part of the problem is police bias. Um, and then part of the problem is the proliferation of guns in our society. Um, American police, it turns out, are 25 times more likely to be killed in the line of duty than our police in the United Kingdom and 40 times more likely to be killed than police officers in Germany. That difference is explained almost entirely by the availability of firearms in our society. Um, guns are used in 70 to 97 percent of all fatal attacks on police and police respond to that risk um, with le lethal force so that the encounters that happen disproportionately the encounters are happening in minority communities and when those encounters happen they're much more likely to end up um, with a dead body at the end of them than they would be in another context. So these are structural problems. Um, my claim here is not that there are no answers to these problems, far from it. It's that the answers to these problems are um, multivalent. And eliminating discrimination is only one part of the puzzle, and in many cases, um, an increasingly small part of the puzzle, in part because discrimination is the way we've defined it in our society, is very hard to prove. Um, and in part because the structural and cultural and institutional features that generate these inequities operate even when people aren't, in fact, discriminating. Um, the, either the discrimination has happened in the past, and that's why we have a segregated minority neighborhood. The discrimination's happened at another level of, of authority. For instance, the decision to heavily police a particular neighborhood, and the consequences are more dire sometimes for reasons that have very little to do with discrimination. Um, again, I don't want to suggest that we abandon the civil rights anti-discrimination approach. It's done good work and it's doing good work. Um, but I do want to suggest that that approach shouldn't be the only way and probably shouldn't even be the central way um, that we think about dealing with problems of social injustice. The, the fact that that approach has captured our imagination because, precisely because, it was so successful in dealing with a discrete type of social problem has meant that we found it harder to deal with other types of social problems. Um, my suggestion, and this is quite general for reform, is that one, we actually need the cooperation of the people that we're regulating. Um, to figure out how to deal with the institutional and institutionalized and cultural forces that are creating these inequalities. Um, and right now, dealing with it exclusively in the context of an adversarial legal system guarantees that we don't get their buy-in very often. Um, in fact, the only times we get their buy-in is perhaps in the form of some consent decree, um, and that, tellingly, can be quite successful at generating reform. But in general, we don't get their buy-in. We need it. Um, and so we might want to consider other approaches to 
getting the cooperation of the regulated entities so that we don't have a situation where it's just courts trying to figure out what to do from the outside without an understanding of the institutions that we're regulating. Um, I'd suggest one thing. Um, if we could think about this as a social problem outside the conventional adversarial legal system and imagine what we do in the context of other types of administrative regulation, one thing that we do is we look at measurable progress and we penalize actors that don't make measurable, measurable progress toward the goal that they have a duty to and um, we reward or at least don't penalize those who do. Um, we now live in a society in which statistical computation is extremely easy to do um, and, and, and increasingly sophisticated, and yet um, we're quite skeptical in many cases of the use of data um, in order to measure outcomes in the context of um, civil rights and anti-discrimination, in part because of the symmetrical approach that I've described and critiqued earlier. We think of any attempt to deal with statistics as requiring proportional representation or quotas and quotas have become a dirty word in our society. I think they shouldn't be. That um, if we look at these types of patterned inequalities as a social problem in need of a solution, um, the way in modern government the administrative state deals with such problems is through numbers. Um, and we've deprived ourselves of that very powerful tool in the context of civil rights, which is too bad. Um, so, in conclusion, um, I think that we need new thinking about these problems in, alongside the old thinking, um, but that to some extent the old thinking is in the way of new thinking because we've t understood it to be the comprehensive solution to the problem rather than one solution among many. Um, and in our contemporary environment, and particularly in confronting uh, a context in which explicit bias and racism is now sadly looking as if it's become more acceptable, we desperately, I think, need both approaches. But thank you. Richard, thanks very much for your talk. I was very interested in your prescription for where we go from here. And it struck me that some of the work by Sable and Simon and what they call democratic experimentalism is consistent with your approach. Is, am I onto something there? Uh, yes, yes. I mean, in fact, I, I know Bill Simon well and um, admire his work. I, and I think that, you know, the, they are looking at new approaches to dealing with some of a wide range of problems in our society, and it's those kind of new ideas that I'd like to see us much more open to. Yes. I'm going to go in and find answer. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you could give an example of your last bullet point. I'm very intrigued with this idea of immunity from discrimination lawsuits and, yeah. and how that might work out. Well, yeah, I mean, I want to tread carefully here, and I can't claim to have a, um, you know, a detailed policy proposal. But what I'd suggest is this. In the contemporary context of anti-discrimination law, um, a complaint by lots of employers, let's just take employers for an example, is, you know, we get blindsided by a, a, a big discrimination suit which um, comes out of the blue. Um, it's very costly in terms of a, a, a bad PR. And um, we as an entity feel like we, didn't, we don't know what we're supposed to do. Um, the entity, so part of the, uh, the idea of the proposal is that the entity is a separate thing from the decision maker. Um, so although the, although the entity is in charge of and responsible for the decisions made by the decision maker, there's not a perfect relationship. Um, what can the entity do? Well, it can set up procedures um, which could be monitored and regulated, um, and it can look to goals and timetables, the old phrase from 
the public contracting context in the 1970s? What if we expanded that to say to the, 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 the entity, as an entity, if you have the appropriate procedures in place, and if you meet the appropriate goals and timetables in improving the problem in your workforce, we'll give you some kind of limited immunity to individual lawsuits. Now, I doubt that's controversial, and I suppose I mean it to be, but what I want to use this example in order to push a point, which is right now, our overwhelming impulse is to think of any instance involving this type of social injustice as an individual injury involving an individual bad actor and an individual victim. And I suggest that we would make better progress as a society if we thought of it as a systemic set of injuries as a result of a culture in which um, both responsibility and injury are diffused. In the contemporary anti-discrimination landscape, um, the number of people who actually file and can successfully uh, complete an anti-discrimination lawsuit is a tiny fraction of the people who are victims of discrimination. We know that. Um, we know, first of all, that the cost of filing the lawsuit is high and that many people with the strongest suits don't bother, um, it, particularly in the context of something like failure to hire. Um, you're a qualified candidate and you're not hired. Do you spend the next two or three years investigating why you weren't hired to find out that it's sex or race discrimination, or do you move on and get hired by someone else? So there's a lot of injury that's happening that's not taken up. Um, uh, employment discrimination lawsuits are the least successful in any civil lawsuit in the federal bar, according to recent statistics, or in the federal courts. Um, and so, it's, uh, you know, uh, we're not doing a great job right now of remedying individual injury. And if we trade it off a little bit of uh, individual entitlement in exchange for a big improvement in the social outcome, I'd suggest that might be a good trade. I thank you very much again. Um, I'm also really intrigued by the prescriptions for a potential uh, new way of thinking about how we approach this. But I, as I think about it, I wonder, uh, how do we make sure that these new ideas, carrots as opposed to only sticks, don't fall prey to the, li the legalistic limitations that we already have? If quotas have become a dirty word, and we create carrots around doing things around integration, uh, won't the unhappy who didn't buy in fight the same battles that have been fought already? Won't, won't fight the same battles that have been fought already. Maybe and and one, two. you know, make a, make a, a ladies' night lawsuit. Or, yes. Uh, uh, no, no doubt. So, I mean, and part of what I'm suggesting is that we need, um, in, in, in the first part of the talk, we do need lawyers and judges to rethink the way they take up the conventional anti-discrimination um, approach to these questions. You know, I think, for instance, as much as I admire Rose Bird's career, that, that it was just wrong to say we can't make value-based distinctions between, you know, that in fact, your job as a judge is to make value-based judgments is between various types of discrimination. Um, and that that needs to be done, and done explicitly, and owned up to, and defended, um, and that that would open, or begin to open, the possibility of these new approaches. But you're right, I mean, if we adopt the position that, um, that Justice Roberts adopted in Parents Involved, that slams the door to a lot of otherwise promising approaches that would be more effective, arguably less costly, and would allow us to use the um, statistical tools that we have available to us. So what do you do in situations where the emotional power of storytelling and an individual's case can be made more effectively than uh, a situation where you're bringing big data into the picture where little Shirley is going to trump big data in a lot of situations? Oh, absolutely in litigation that's true. And that's part of um, why I also suggest that 
we can attack this problem in some instances more effectively through something that looks like an administrative remedy or regulation as opposed to litigation. Um, but litigation is great for telling that compelling story. And you know, again, there's a place for that. Um, don't want to suggest otherwise. But um, the administrative state can do remarkable things with respect to big pervasive problems in which responsibility is diffused, but large entities can um, make an intervention. And that's what we haven't done much of on this in, in the context of, um, of, of, of civil rights and these kinds of social injustices. We've done a little bit. Um, you know, there's precedent in the context of government contracting, for instance, for um, requirements like government contractors don't underutilize um, and goals and timetables, but it's very limited and it's embattled. I'd like to see that approach expanded. Um, and, it, it, and it's true that what I'm suggesting is that the emotional story that's proved so effective and so powerful in certain instances is now in the way. That the, because the inability to tell that emotional story um, or the um, desperation to find a way to tell that emotional story, even when it doesn't quite fit the problem, has distracted us from potential more sweeping solutions. Um, so sometimes we need the emotional story, but I think we rely way too heavily on it right now. Yeah, I, I agree. I, you know, I mean, I'm not a statistician by training, um, but I work with people. Oh, okay, yes, yeah, I, I, I work with people who are very, very good at, quanti uh, at quantitative um, statistical methods. And you know, one of their great frustrations is when the statistics aren't believed when they're ironclad, or when dueling statisticians can cloud the issue in the context of litigation when there's one side that's clearly right and the other side that's just lying. Um, so better statistical training could fix that problem, but that's endemic to the litigation system in which you have a judge who may or may not be well versed enough in the statistical methods to tell the difference between um, you know, good statistical methods and bad ones. Um, I think we could do better in the context of the, uh, of, um, the administration with respect to that because we do have the information in some cir circumstances. It's not that, that we don't know, it's that we can't get the information where it needs to be. Um, but you know, it is certain, and, and another thing, it's um, one thing I would like, my ambition for this approach is that we don't have to worry so much about the, 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 the complexities that you've described. We can kind of leave that to the decision maker. So if we simply say, look, we know that these numbers are no good. Um, we know that you know, 3%, 4% women in a field where you've got 50% women in the applicant pool is no good. Um, you can argue about whether or not it's because you had discriminatory hiring practices or whether it's because you recruited from places where women were underrepresented or it's culture fit or whatever. You fix that. 
you know, but we expect to see an improvement in these numbers. You're more aware of where the problem's coming from. <laughs> Same with policing. If you say that it's not biased officers, but it's, you know, problems in the neighborhood or whatever, you, yeah, you know that very well. But we expect to see, you know, fewer of these kinds of harassment arrests. Um, we expect to see improved numbers over time, and you can figure out how to do that better than, um, certainly better than a judge or a lawyer who's only, you know, looking at that for a discrete period of time. So I think, you know, it, it does require um, controversial policy judgments about, you know, just how much improvement is reasonable to expect. I acknowledge that. Um, and those are political questions that are going to be hard to answer. But I do think in the contemporary environment, you know, there's pretty widespread agreement that some of these things are a problem. That there's a relatively small number of people who say like, eh, you know, I think this is just fine the way it is. There's some, but not that many. And so having acknowledged that there's a problem, we can at least have consensus that there ought to be some improvement. Um, and we'll find out how much later. Professor Ford, uh, certainly the, the courts have been uh, responsible and complicit in a lot of uh, decisions over the history of the United States that have been unfair. Uh, I suspect that they're going to continue to be. But my, my concern is, uh, in when you say pursuing an administrative, perhaps, kind of, I'll use the term remedy, it, it kind of, I'm troubled by it. My concern is, well, who are the administrators? Or who appoints the administrators? So if we go to our current elected, elected officers, you know, I would be, personally, I would be very, very concerned about an administrator appointed by the current uh, administration uh, trying to uh, f come up with a remedy for me. Right. Um, and so, I mean, and so we have, you know, we have the issue with federal uh, laws, we have issues with state laws, we have municipal laws, et cetera, et cetera. So, I, I you understand. got me worried. Right. Um, I, I, I was afraid someone was going to ask that question because, of course, that is the, I mean, there's a weakness to any institutional approach to this problem. And I pointed out some of the weaknesses of relying on litigation and, and, and lawyers in the judiciary. The weakness of the administrative approach is exactly what you put your finger on. Um, these are political appointees, and there's also potentially the problem of capture if the administration in, in, in question isn't vigilant about that. Um, it's, that's a problem. Um, I won't deny it. I will say this, that it, uh, these are, to some significant extent, problems that will have to be resolved in the political sphere um, with the problems of democracy. Now, again, I don't want to say that we should abandon litigation, but well, at least given the way our approach to litigation has evolved, um, it's a limited approach. And it's one that is you know, increasingly running up against its limits in terms of the kind of injustices we face. So um, at least a more sustained focus on the inevitably political nature of the problems and the remedies um, has the potential to give us better outcomes when the right people are in charge. Um, but to be sure, just as it, it, with anything else in democracy, if the wrong people are in charge, um, you're going to get bad policies and bad outcomes. I have a question very much along these same lines, but I'm wondering about, I mean, I, I find your proposal at the end very intriguing to move away from the model of focusing on the bad actor and trying to figure out how to, you know, to create new incentives to avoid that problem. Think about the problem of uh, police violence. Um, so that, you know, that we've seen focusing on the bad actor is very ineffective at coming up with solutions. And I, I don't, th just thinking through, if we had a, a say, a, a federal program that gave money to local police departments if they could show a decrease in the number of lethal encounters with civilians. Um, and I, and, and I could see the appeal of that. I could see why that would, might be a nice program, because then the local police would have to think about what do we need to do to decrease lethal encounters, and they'll come up with solutions, and we think that they'll figure out a way, and we don't have to point fingers at them and say, you're bad actors. They just know if they start, if they 
you know, uh, start killing fewer people, they'll get more money, and we think that the culture would be good. My, the, my concern about it is then, are there unintended consequences of a program like that that are gonna recreate the problem that we're dealing with? That is, is there something like Milliken that's gonna be out there where, you know, the, the, you know if you know, they're gonna continue to do the bad thing that we're concerned about, but figure out some way to, to keep getting, you know, to get the money that, that we're after? Or, or is this concern, you know, is this, you know, it, should we, is it worth the, whatever the risk of mm -hmm. these bad consequences or figuring out ways around the system? Maybe it's capture by the administrative agency or maybe they're gonna be fighting about what constitutes a lethal encounter. They'll be using not more non-lethal encounters. There'll be uh -huh. more, you know, there'll be other harms that will increase to do, you know, to address this problem, or is it worth yeah. you know whatever you know mm -hmm. trying the experiment in the first place? Right. Um, so yeah, I, I mean I think it's true that there's always the risk and indeed probably the certainty that regulated entities will try to manipulate the metrics in some way. Um, and I'm sure that problem is quite pronounced in other areas of administrative law where compliance is based on on metrics. You know, I mean I'm thinking pollution, um, for instance, where you know whatever type of pollution is regulated, the, the company reduces that, but they may increase pollution that's not regulated or that's regulated less severely. Um, so yeah, it's a risk. Um, it does seem to me that that's a question of the design of the policy and you know, a, a, a sufficiently thoughtful design would be able to head off at least some of those problems. Um, I do think that there's a, also a big question of which level of government needs to be pressed, and particularly with police violence. Um, uh, you know, is it the state or the local? Uh, because the state is responsible for the organization of the local governments. So you don't get Ferguson without a state that allows its, its um, local government entities to be set up in such a way that you've got police departments that can't, uh, you know, afford to operate without revenue policing. Maybe the, the state is the right place to put the pressure. Um, but, you know, my thought is, if you could make it more, you know, financially better for Ferguson not to engage in revenue policing than to engage in it, that would be a step in the right direction. Um, and yes, I mean, I think there are problems with institutional design and their risks, but they're risks that um, could be managed. So this is, I'll, this is a completely unfair analogy, okay. right? And, and, but my point is I wonder how, how this gets sold or how, how this gets, this idea gets spread because one of the things that I keep thinking in this regard is, again, it's unfair, but it's like tort reform. You know, you have, you have, you have a program out there where there's suspicion as to why are you enacting tort reform. Is it the trial lawyers are on one side, the insurance companies are, are on another side, how do you get to a point where it's not viewed as tort reform, but it's viewed as something that is beneficial all around? Yeah, um, so that's an interesting question. I, my thought is that there is room for some win-win proposals, at least with respect to the parties that are conventionally plaintiffs and those that are conventionally defendants in these types of lawsuits. So, um, you know, you know with respect to employment discrimination, for instance, um, you might think that a proposal that's going to uh, require the employer to meet certain numerical goals or to demonstrate that they're using best, best practices or something like that would be something employers would hate. But um, often you hear the employer say, we don't know what we're supposed to do. If someone would just tell us what we're supposed to do to avoid these lawsuits, we'll do it. But what's happening now is that you know one manager does the wrong thing, and then we get hit with a giant lawsuit, um, and and it's bad for PR, and it doesn't reflect what we really um, are value in our business. So they might actually prefer more regulation, you know, that gives them something like a safe harbor. This is you know you're now in compliance. You're not a bad actor. You don't deserve a big PR hit. You've done the things that we think you should be doing in order to. Um, you, you know, improve the situation. Um, now, on the plaintiff side, the loser is the individual who might have won the lawsuit, um, but now is going to be faced with an employer with immunity or some kind of a, or a new affirmative defense. I mean, this, I'm actually kind of borrowing this 
from the idea of affirmative defenses in the sex harassment context, for instance, where you know if that kind of rule worked well, there's argument about whether it does, but if it worked well, you could say most potential victims of sex harassment would be better off with an employer with a good policy in place to stop it, um, even though the employer gets the affirmative defense in the individual case. So the individual um, is arguably worse off, but in that context, the individuals don't know who they are in advance. And um, we, we can presume that most people would rather not have a lawsuit, they'd rather not have the harassment or the discrimination or whatever it is in the first place. Um, so there's a potential for win-win with respect to this, I think. Now, you know, certainly there are people who are going to dislike it because it's quotas on ideological grounds. Uh, and you know, those people just are, are our enemies and they have to be defeated if the proposal is going to move forward. But I think most people, you know, it's not anti-business or it's not anti-employer. That's the important part. Um, it can be pro-social justice and kind of pro-employer at the same time. That's what I'd like to think. And I think something similar is true with police where, you know, people running police departments generally don't want to have a police department that's just involved in the business of, of uh, harassing people of color. That's not the objective. Um, and, but there is a problem with the institutional culture, there's a problem with bias on the part of individual officers, some not all, um, and there's a problem of these institutional and structural factors that haven't been unearthed. I bet you the Ferguson Police Department would like nothing better than to have enough money that they didn't need to engage in revenue policing. Um, and that's where we want to get. Um, where you know you could do your the real job as a police officer and not this this job that's been foisted on you by um, by by finances. Now, you know there there are cases that are going to be harder than that um, to to crack. I acknowledge, but I do think that there's some win-win cases. There's some low-hanging fruit, if you will, and at least we could pick that. Okay. So I'm going to do one more question. I'm going to have right over here. Um, Um, hello, I'm an undergrad. My name is Asia. I just wanted to ask, um, do you think legislation is the true solution to altering the underlying power bias um, embedded in American society? Do you think legislation is the true solution? No, I would say legislation is a partial solution. Um, you know, I, I, and it, the, the, what I would be proposing in terms of legislative reform, we could analogize it to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. That was legislation, but the way the legislation worked was that it gave individuals a private right of action and that the main me enforcement mechanism was private enforcement. That's a policy decision. Um, you know, from the level of policy, it's a policy decision to decide that we're going to go about enforcing the law through private litigation as opposed to some other mechanism. And my suggestion is that we can at least re-examine that policy decision and ask us how well it's worked, whether it makes sense, and in what context it makes sense to continue that, and whether it needs to be augmented in other ways. But ultimately, legislation is only a partial solution. I mean, I think the, uh, the, the ideal and what one sees in environments where um, these kinds of long-standing inequities are, are, are really um, improved is um, a combination of you know, legislation and social morality and changes in the culture that feed on each other until the old practices just aren't acceptable anymore. Um, so that over time you don't need that much in the way of regulation and lawsuits because people just aren't doing it. Public accommodations are a good example of a case in which, you know, it's extremely rare now to hear about discrimination in restaurants or lunch counters or nightclubs. Every once in a while you hear about it, but that's not a significant social problem. The law worked, and it worked remarkably well and remarkably quickly because it was the right law targeted at the right kind of problem um, so that the whole apparatus and, 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 and cultural support system just kind of crumbled. Um, I hope that we could find similarly well-targeted solutions for some of these problems that now look really intractable because they're different in significant ways than public accommodations discrimination was. Um, and right now we're kind of treating them all similar and we've had great success in public co accommodations but employment not so hot, housing terrible, really terrible. Um, re results, and um, so maybe that should make us think we need another policy approach to kind of begin a, a, a virtuous cycle. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so I just want to thank everyone for uh, coming out this afternoon uh, to
hear Professor Ford, and a huge thank you to Professor Ford for your talk. So we have a, I'm not going to tell you what it is, oh, but um, but maybe you want to use it for your book signing, which ah, <laughs> okay. uh. <laughs> which is actually going to take place right uh, outside here, outside of 283. Uh, the bookstore is staffed, so there are uh, copies of uh, Professor's book, Universal Rights, Rights Gone Wrong. Don't, no, no, no down under. Writes down to down, earth. Yeah, down to earth. My own I, I know, okay. me too. That's, I was hoping you could help me. Um, so, books are for purchase. You can use cash, uh, credit card. If you're a student, you can use your student ID. And then Professor Ford will be uh, seated outside to sign them. So, if you wanted to catch him and say a few words, outside will be the great, best place to do it. But I've got to keep him on schedule. So, okay. um, so thank you all for being here this afternoon. Thank you.